Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is the infamous Roger Stone. I'm a big fan for a lot of reasons. I, I consider Roger a personal friend, so don't expect me to be too harsh on him today. But regardless of your opinion of Roger Stone, you cannot deny his brilliance, his significance, his role in modern American politics, and the beautiful spirit of rebelliousness to authority that he brings to the conversation, especially after his recent legal battles, loss, and final victory. Roger, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing, brother? Uh, uh, anyway, it was a technological challenge to get with you, but I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and um, let me start off by saying that I'm, uh, I'm disappointed that your candidacy as the Libertarian Party candidate for president did not succeed because it would have been nice to offer the voters an actual choice. Uh, that is not to say that I am not uh, committed to Donald Trump because I am. He literally spared my life when the oppressive deep state, uh, contrary to all legal precedents, contrary to their own rules and regulations, contrary to the facts regarding my age and my health, and contrary to uh, the, uh, the situation in the correctional facility they wanted to send me to, was intent on sending me uh, to my death. In other words, the prison they were insisting that I be sent to, I challenged this twice in court and lost, um, had, uh, had multiple, at that point, over 100 cases of COVID-19. This prison, in the week before I was to uh, surrender, released a child pornographer, uh, a, a, a serial rapist, an armed bank robber, uh, and a pedophile to protect them from COVID-19. But Roger Stone uh, needs to be incarcerated immediately. In other words, the Department of Justice and Bureau of Prisons policy of taking people convicted of nonviolent crimes and moving them to home incarceration or home confinement or to, ser or to time served, if you were already in, that policy applied to everybody in the country, in every uh, judicial circuit in the country, except for Roger Stone. That's how dangerous I am to the deep state. That's how dangerous I am to the entrenched interests. So if anything, I may be now more radicalized than you are. I mean, I, I have seen this experience, this experience. Before, uh, and the judicial system in the United States, sadly, is a joke. The notion of a fair trial by a jury of your peers, it may appear in the Constitution, but don't expect it because you won't get it. And when you appeal, you would think that going higher in the judicial system would get you a fairer hearing uh, or fairer consideration. You can forget that as well, because the upper courts are loath to uh, overrule their colleagues on the lower courts. The only person in the country who's gotten screwed worse than me is General Michael Flynn. They made up his they made up completely whole cloth. Uh, uh, and uh, with indisputable evidence that he committed no crimes whatsoever and that he was completely set up, the, the, the federal judge in his case, Emmett Sullivan, still refuses to, to dismiss the charges. In fact, in an extraordinary act of abuse of power, he has, with no legal authority whatsoever, appointed a new special counsel to determine whether Flynn should now be charged with perjury because he gave in to government pressure to plead guilty to a crime he didn't commit because they were threatening to go after his son. I mean, it just boggles the mind. This boggles the mind. This I, I didn't expect to get into this right away, uh, but I, I, since you I, and, I, and I appreciate the, the whole summary of, of where you're at right now. And you know, again, congratulations for having gotten to this point. But I, I'm, and, and I don't blame you, even if you don't believe in it, for playing the COVID card to get out of incarceration. But you don't believe all this crap, do you? Do you, you really believe that, that the coronavirus is as big a threat as, as government uh, says? No, I don't. I do believe that it is a threat when you're 67 years old and you have underlying conditions of uh, asthma, which I've had my entire life. I mean, look, my son is a police officer. I know people who have died from this. I think the virus is real. I don't think it is as contagious as they tell us. 
I don't think that it that it that it is the public health danger that they tell us. Uh, I think it is probably no more dangerous than the flu. But that's not the question. The question was whether I particularly was vulnerable. My, I've had the same physician for 25 years. He believes that my physical condition, while generally good, but with underlying problems that are all respiratory, would make me vulnerable. But let's be very clear. Trump commuted my sentence on two grounds. One, it was the humanitarian grounds of mercy. I probably would have died in prison. And the purpose of that is to make sure my appeal is never heard. Because if I ever get to a fair court on appeal, they all get exposed, every one of them, including the Democrats in Congress. Secondarily, uh, he understood that I did not get even the minimum uh, of a fair trial. I had a deeply biased judge. I had a jury forewoman who was caught red-handed attacking me on social media in 2019, keeping those posts on a private setting during jury selection in my trial, and then erasing them, deleting them after the trial. But the judge said that didn't show any evidence of bias. What planet does she live on? Uh, I had a juror that could have been the Clinton-Obama administration alumni reunion a party. Uh, there were no Republicans. There were no conservatives. There were no libertarians. There were no military veterans. There were no independents. Uh, there were there were certainly no conservatives. There were no free thinkers. I mean, it was a lockstep uh, Hillary Clinton-loving, uh, Donald Trump-hating jury. Uh, their minds were made up long before they even entered the courtroom. Uh, it's a mockery. Uh, the system is really badly, badly broken. And then, of course, as soon as I was commuted, they go back and they recycle the same bullshit all over again. Stone was a Russian spy. No, I'm not. Uh, we Stone was in touch with Russian intelligence. No, I wasn't. Uh, Stone uh, was covering up for Trump and he made a deal. He blackmailed Trump for clemency in return for his silence. There is no evidence of that whatsoever because it's not true. Uh, it, it is a, it's a broken system and the, the government uh, and the two-party duopoly, which are sadly, even though I'm a, you know, uh, I'm a birthright Republican, but the two parties work together uh, to, uh, to uh, clamp down on the freedom of the people. Uh, and they are in lockstep with the corporate-owned media. This is one entity. They move together. Now, suddenly, you have uh, all of these um, former prosecutors coming forward saying, Roger Stone can be retried. Roger Stone is a Russian. We're all the way back at the beginning. They had $30 million and three years to prove any of this nonsense, and they couldn't prove any of it. But now they're saying we need to investigate again. In fact, Andrew Weissman, who's a particularly vile little weasel, says we should take Stone in front of the grand jury. We should drag him in front of the grand jury. Jackass, you had three years to take me to the grand jury. You never called because you have nothing. You keep trying to make stuff up. It's very dangerous to be controversial in America today. You know that. It's very dangerous to just speak your mind. It's, it's we're in this very, very scary place. Well, speaking of which, I think we're in a uniquely scary place because of the coronavirus. Is a, a cloud hanging over really the whole world right now. And if you say that the virus is, I, I mean, I think you said it was, it was overblown, the threat, you acknowledge the threat is largely overblown, and that, you know, it's, it's really only a significant risk to people who have specific, you know, health factors that go into that. How can you support Donald Trump still after having declared a state of emergency, increase government spending radically as a result, and, and enabled and emboldened all of the shutdowns that are being carried out by governors with that national state of emergency, when you, you have someone who actually cares about freedom with Joe Jorgensen as an alternative. First of all, I've never heard of the libertarians have nominated, and I'm highly confident that he can't raise five bucks, which means he will never be competitive. Uh, this is why they should have nominated you. Female. I'm sorry. She's a great, she's a genuine, principled, philosophical libertarian. And yes, I, I appreciate the kind words that localization would have been a more significant, uh, you know, alternative to this. But you know that there's an alternative when Trump is so bad on all this. Well, no, he's actually better than the alternative, which is Joe Biden. First of all, I think you recognize we have a 40-year personal relationship. And right now I would be in a dank 
squalid federal prison in Georgia eating bologna sandwiches and look at for, looking forward to dying. So uh, I thought his, uh, his decision to commute my sentence in an election year was an incredibly courageous uh, thing to do. It was the morally right thing to do. Uh, and I'm no happier with some of his policies, or I should say some of the bad advice that he's been given than you are. But only one of two people is going to be president after this election. It is either going to be Donald Trump or it is going to be Joe Biden. Uh, and I think the president has learned a great deal in his first term. Uh, you cannot argue with his economic success, cutting regulations and cutting taxes, did build the most robust uh, and the most vibrant economy in our history. In this particular case, I understand that he had no choice but to err on the side of caution. He's not a scientist. The projections, thank God, turned out to be wrong, but he had to take them seriously. Now, if we have a second shutdown, which he clearly opposes, that would be a different story. But I don't think he's going to do that. Uh, and uh, we still have a, a irresponsible mainstream media beating the drum to make this pandemic seem more dangerous than it is. Again, I'm not saying that the Chinese virus is a hoax. I don't think it is a hoax, but I don't think it is. It has posed the, the problem that the uh, that those who have a vested interest in scare tactics uh, tell us it did. So when Russia failed and then Ukraine failed, they took advantage of something that is real, unlike those scandals, um, but they have tried to benefit uh, from, uh, from the public fear. We both know that this leads to mandatory vaccination. Well, let me give you a hint. No way, not a chance, even for me. And I think I'm vulnerable. I'm just not taking a vaccination developed by Bill Gates. Uh, I, I don't think it's safe. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, this is designed to uh, disrupt the reelection of a guy who is uh, taken on the status quo in a number of areas. Is he perfect? No, but no one is perfect. Only he is perfect. And he just saved my life in the larger sense. So um, I'm going to stick with Trump. I, I believe in him. I think his instincts are good. I think you would agree that he's made some. But overall, America was safer and stronger and in many ways freer um, than it would be under Joe Biden. Joe Biden is a front man. Uh, he's a front man for the Obama group, the same people who got caught in the greatest abuse of power in American history, where they used the actual full authority of the government and the incredible capability of our intelligence agencies to literally spy on the Republican candidate for president and then used completely fabricated evidence that actually came from Russian intelligence, if you want the Russian collusion, there it is right there, uh, to gin up a coup attempt. Nobody who believes in free elections could possibly believe in that. So um, uh, yes, I do not want to put the Obamas back in power. I do not want to put Susan Rice and Valerie Jarrett and Samantha Powers and James Comey and John Brennan and, and uh, James Clapper, this cabal of criminals back in power. So I'm 100% for Donald Trump and proud of it. Well, I don't think I have to get into all the ways that our, our worldviews differ here, where I'm, I'm just as suspect of the criminals in red jumpsuits as the ones in blue jumpsuits. But I'm gonna, I want to ask you some more interesting questions here. Uh, if you were Joe Jorgensen's campaign manager for whoever, uh, whoever the Libertarian nominee is, whether you know or not, what would you do with her campaign right now to have a breakout year for the Libertarian Party, even if you think an outright victory isn't possible? And I think if Roger Stone was, was managing a Libertarian presidential campaign, I think you could have a lot of serious impact. Maybe not this year, of course, but after Trump's second term, if, if, if you get your way here. Uh, do you think you could, Roger Stone, get a libertarian elected president? What would it take? Who? Who? What's the candidate's name again? You see the problem? Well, see the problem? Right now it's Joe Jorgensen is the nominee. Yes, I get. I see what you're doing there. But hey, we're repeating her name, aren't we? No, but you know, what would you do to have a breakout year for the Libertarian Party this year or for 2024? You know, what would you want for a libertarian candidate? And do you think you could? that soon? Is it even within the realm of, even if, if we had the genius of Roger Stone on our side in a post-Trump, as you would say, more freedom-oriented America, would it be possible 
to elect a libertarian for president? Well, I'd say two things. First of all, as you know, uh, in 2012, um, I bolted the party of Goldwater and Reagan. I bolted the party that I loved, the party I grew up in, which to me was the more conservative and therefore in many ways more libertarian of the two parties to support uh, Governor Gary Johnson, who had a very credible record as governor, helped him win the 2012 nomination because I could see that Mitt Romney was a big government, deep state phony from the beginning, nothing conservative or libertarian about him. His views were identical to those of Barack Obama. He just masked it a little bit. Uh, and therefore, um, and I'm not ashamed in any way of my association, however brief, with the Libertarian Party. But I did get to experience firsthand the structural and legal barriers to electing a Libertarian uh, or third party candidate for that matter. Now, it is interesting to me that in 2012, uh, Gary Johnson running on, in 49 states, uh, get, I think getting on the ballot in 48 states, I believe, uh, and therefore more than able theoretically to win 270 electoral votes, should have been included in the debates, as should have the Green Party candidate, because she also got on the ballot in enough states to theoretically reach 270. That should be the threshold, not some artificial poll number that the Presidential Commission on Debates, which is not appointed by the president, is not a commission, and is not about debate, uh, decides to set. And then when Johnson did meet their threshold, they had a quick meeting of their board and they changed their threshold upward to make sure he wasn't in the debates. So if you can't, this is the chicken and, and the egg problem. You can't get well known unless you're in the debates and you can't get in the debates unless you are well known. That's a tough problem, which is one of the reasons why I have urged the president not to agree to the schedule uh, of the presidential commission on debates, to set his own said schedule and make his own decisions as to who he thinks ought to be included uh, as a condition of his uh, uh, participation. Now, I've not made that recommendation privately. I've made it quite publicly, uh, but it is what I think he should do. Then you have the difficult problem of ballot access, which is, uh, as you know, an extraordinarily expensive and difficult problem. It's not an insurmountable problem, as Gary Johnson uh, proved twice. It is curious, however, why Johnson received almost no media attention in his 2012 bill bid, which to me was the more credible of his uh, campaigns. But in 2016, after he brought on the deep state quizzling Bill Weld, who's a friend of mine and a brilliant guy, but um, but deeply committed to the Clintons uh, and hopefully uh, getting and hopefully the getting you know, Roger, ironic that I would say the same from my experience from having started my uh, nomination bid so early at the beginning phases of that. It was like I was running against Weld. And like, I, it's weird to deal with a guy who is so gentlemanly and and direct and friendly and honest and, and in all of those other accounts, a great guy, and then does slimy shit like vouch for Hillary Clinton right before yeah, the election but, in 16. But you notice how yeah. much mainstream media coverage the Johnson Weld ticket got in 2016 that they didn't get in 2012 when he had a terrific running rate, Judge Jim Gray, who's a real libertarian, a real gentleman, who's been really one of the most effective spokesmen against the archaic racist war on drugs, uh, but they could get no coverage. Now in 2016, when the mainstream media begins to believe that they're bleeding votes from Donald Trump, well, suddenly they get, you know, a town hall on CNN. They get extraordinary opportunities. And as much as I love Gary Johnson as a person, and I do, um, I, I don't think he makes maximum advantage of those media opportunities, which I was candidly happy about because I was deeply committed and had an antecedent commitment to Donald Trump. Uh, I don't think you're going to see much coverage of the minor party candidates uh, in this election. I don't think they're going to have an impact. Uh, until you can change the state ballot laws and until you can break this hammerlock on the debates, I don't see how the Libertarian Party breaks through. Hey. Where the hey. Assuming the Libertarian nominee, assuming the Libertarian Party that we maintain our 50 state ballot access or, or enough to, to have a plausible path to victory, would you say that, that Joe Jorgensen 
should be allowed in the debates? And if she's not, what should we do to get her in the debates? Uh, I'm up on this question. If she is on the ballot in enough states uh, to uh, to acquire 270 electoral votes, then yes, I think that should be the criteria. Uh, I also think if the Green Party candidate meets that that threshold, that they should also be in the debates. I absolutely believe that uh, because I'm consistent. But at the same time, uh, the real battle ahead will remain within the Republican Party because post-Trump, whether he wins or whether he loses, and I think in the end he will win, uh, although I'm worried about ballot fraud and I'm particularly worried about internet uh, uh, censorship, uh, and I'm worried about the mainstream media regaining their stranglehold on the political narrative in this country, uh, the real battle will be again within the Republican Party. Does the Republican Party uh, go back to its country club roots uh, of being a vehicle to make money for the Bushes? Or does the party uh, move further uh, towards a reform agenda, taking the best elements of Donald Trump's platform and perhaps heading in a more libertarian direction uh, by nominating somebody like, I don't know, General Michael Flynn, for example, uh, who would be who meets the criteria of having universal name ID, being a real conservative, uh, believing in the liberty, believing in the Constitution. Um, I don't know if he is interested. He's been through the same horrific experience that I have at the hands of a vengeful, politically oriented prosecutor who wanted nothing more than to either flip me to get me to testify against Trump, which on March 14th of 2019, I simply refused to do. I mean, I most definitely could have lied. I want to be very clear because some on the left, Congressman Jerry Nadlier, for example, uh, Congressman Adam Schiff, uh, Congressman Eric Swallowswell, these guys have attempted to uh, pervert what I am saying. I'm not saying that I knew of misconduct by the president and refused to testify about it. What I'm saying is I refused to lie. I refused to to recite composed testimony to make some kind of deal for leniency in my own sentencing. I wouldn't do that. I simply refused. Uh, and that's why I faced, in essence, what was a death penalty uh, uh, and, and uh, the real danger of dying in prison. So thank God for the president's courage. But I do think the central fight, unfortunately, uh, and it's not that I didn't try the libertarian route and gave it everything I had, I think the central fight will be within the Republican Party to see whether the two parties will go back to being absolutely identical. I know you argue they are today, but they aren't. Uh, or whether one of the parties will offer a real alternative to the socialism, the globalist socialism, uh, oppressive hand of big government that the Democrats now seem to be totally uh, bought into. Whatever happened to the Democratic Party of John F. Kennedy? that was anti-authoritarian and anti-communist. That party just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, what happened to the Republican Party of Ronald Reagan? And yes, I think Donald Trump. Well, we're going to find out soon. Uh, I, I'm praying for the president's I'm re-election. Praying for the president's re-election. How about the party of Goldwater and Ron Paul? Say it again, I'm sorry. How about, I'm surprised you didn't reference Goldwater. Why not call it that? I mean, if you want to talk about it, the roots of the Republican Party as being more principally uh, grounded in smaller government, uh, why not reference Goldwater? And, and just as an aside here, what, what, what's your take on Dr. Ron Paul? Uh, well, let's take them one by one. Um, I often reference Goldwater because that's what brought me to American politics. That's why the idea of my being a Russian spy is so absurd. My relatives were mowed down by Russian tanks in Budapest in 1956. Anti-communism is what attracted me to the Republican Party, uh, the, the party of Goldwater, the party of, of Reagan, uh, now the party of Trump. Uh, I'm a fan of both Dr. Ron Paul, that's the last Republican I voted for in the Republican primaries before I became a libertarian. And I'm also a fan of his son, Rand Paul, who I think is a libertarian oriented conservative as as opposed to a pure libertarian but he is anti uh, foreign war he's anti spying on the american people he stands up for civil liberties uh you know if i were in the us senate i think my voting record would be very much like his i think my agenda would be very much like his i have no intention of running for the senate right now of course as a convicted felon i'm not eligible to run for the senate but 
It's important, by the way, to mention that I do have a video video my page. I'm a child, and I live in Arizona. I'm not allowed to vote in my home state of Arizona, but because the presidency is a constitutional office, it doesn't say you not being a felon is not a requirement to be president. Is there is there something else in the Senate? I'm pretty sure you could run for Senate. I, I think I mean, I, I'd love to see you run for office. Yeah, I, well, you know, I have so many skeletons, they would be jumping out of the closet. There'd be uh, it would be really it would be entertaining. I'll say that the National Enquirer would have a field day. No, I'm uh, I'm committed to the mechanics of politics, as you know, to the to the use of the mechanics of politics to to pursue certain constitutional principles. I think you and I both uh, agree about. But that said, I, I think the Constitution and our democratic system is very much up for grabs. If uh, I expect the next election, I think the worst possible result, and unfortunately a, a highly probable or at least possible result, is that the next election will be nakedly stolen, that there will be such widespread voter fraud in so many states uh, that Donald Trump will not get a fair uh, election. Uh, and then you can already see the Democrats trying to limit his ability to challenge the results, no matter how overwhelming the evidence may be. They're already saying Trump is going to lose and then refuse to leave office. You can They're, they're setting this up. Translation, we intend to steal this and we don't want him to, to challenge our theft. Let's be fair, they're setting him up as well if he loses to be able to blame voter fraud. But I, I want to go. I want my audience to like you as much as I do. And and when when we first ha- hung out, you told me that you're you're a libertarian at heart and in spirit because you don't like being told what to do. And I and I and from you know and I, I want to recommend everybody watch the documentary. Get me Roger Stone Netflix. It's a brilliant uh, just coverage of the man and and just uh, you know portrayal of how compelling your personality is. And I think it backs up. Your general assertion. I mean, I believe you. I, I, there are a lot of people who who bullshit as conservatives or Republicans. Oh yes, I'm I'm really libertarian at heart. I, I do believe you in that. And I, I and I want, uh, you know, I want my audience to appreciate that. But what does it mean? You said earlier that you were radicalized by your experience recently with the legal system. But also, like, how does that relate for you to identifying as a libertarian? Do you still apply that term to yourself? Oh, no question about it. I mean, I, I am I am more sour on uh, on the realities of our democracy today than ever because I have seen I've been through this meat grinder. It's really extraordinary. So you get charged with a federal crime, which is a nonviolent process crime, but while you're on trial, the judge takes away your free speech rights, so you can't defend yourself. Where is that in the Constitution? I can't seem to find that part in the Constitution where they're allowed to do that. Or, in my case, the judge or rules that I cannot raise the issue of misconduct by the Office of Special Counsel or the FBI or the Department of Justice or any member of Congress in my defense, even though the Supreme Court has ruled that the, uh, that the uh, integrity of an investigation, uh, indictment, or prosecution is always fair grounds for an issue on defense doesn't matter. I can't argue selective prosecution that Mueller, Comey, Clapper, Brennan, Hillary, or this list goes on and on, all lied to Congress. The difference between them and me, of course, is they lied about material matters. They lied about things of consequence. Um, in, in my case, um, I made misstatements that were innocuous and hid no underlying crimes. Therefore, I had no intent. I went there voluntarily to begin with. Who who goes to a committee voluntarily and then lies under oath? The answer is no one. Uh, and then uh, this comes, as you know, after almost 16 months of he- reading and hearing, Roger Stone will be indicted for treason. Roger Stone will be indicted for espionage. Roger Stone will be indicted for conspiracy against the United States, mail fraud, wire fraud, money laundering. And of course, no evidence of any of those crimes could be found. But That didn't stop several federal judges from uh, issuing search warrants that allowed the government to conduct a full legal proctological examination in every corner of my life. And they still had to hoke up lying to Congress in in an incredibly fraudulent, fabricated indictment, which I thought I could beat. But that's because I assumed that I would have a fair trial. I've already been through the flaws in my trial, but now you add on top of it 
now that my sentence has been commuted, this this tsunami of disinformation. There's a there's a post from Hakeem Jeffries, who's an African American member of Congress from New York City. Roger Stone lied to cover up for Donald Trump. He can be reindicted January 21st. No, Hakeem, sorry. You have no evidence of that whatsoever. You couldn't prove it in a courtroom. Robert Mueller had three years and $30 million to prove it. Stop saying it. It's not true. Now, whether or not they could recharge me, who knows? These people don't play by any rules. You now have Andrew Weissman, who was the de facto head of the Mueller investigation, openly uh, calling on Department of Justice employees not to cooperate with the investigation into the entire Russian collusion hoax or the unmasking of officials in Trump's administration. I think that's called obstruction of justice. If I did it, that's certainly what they would be calling it. So we do have a two-tiered justice system. I guess that's what I was really getting at, that there is one system. There is one system. There's a lot more than just two-tiered. And there is a lot more than just two-tiered. Uh, I, I'm not sure where we are here, but what I was saying, but what I was saying is that we have is that we have a system of justice for the global ruling elite, regardless of party, uh, and their goals are money and power. They have no real ideology other than the ideology of oppression and control. Uh, or is there a different sy system of justice for people like you and I and General Flynn, uh, whose basic constitutional rights are just stomped on and nobody other than us, of course, seems to care. I mean, that's not really true because 65,000 brave Americans contributed to my legal defense. Uh, I financially lost everything in this struggle. I lost my home, my savings, my free speech rights, my ability, therefore, to make a living. Uh, what little insurance I had, um, I sold anything, any asset I had to pay legal expenses. I could never have defended myself uh, uh, without the help of 65,000 great Americans who contributed both to my legal defense fund, but also to a family fund to help just help basically help me stay alive. Uh, you know, we're talking about groceries and gasoline and medical expenses and prescription drugs and rent. Um, but uh, thank God that there are that many, you know, uh, freedom-oriented Americans who did not like what was being done to me and saw through the mainstream media interpretation. I mean, most people couldn't even tell you what it is I was charged with or convicted of. They just know I was convicted of something. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's very scary because, Adam, if it can happen to me, and I'm, I started being fairly well-known, now I'm very well-known, well, then it can happen to anybody. Any Americans can lose their voice, and lose their freedoms literally overnight at the hands of a tyrannical judicial system, which has no interest in justice, which is just interested in pursuing a political agenda. It's a very, very, it's a very, very. Yeah, one of the things I think a lot of people listening to this who aren't fully familiar with your story might go, "Oh, he's denying. He's playing into the drama. He's playing the victim card." But I, I want to point out that you're kind of holding back here on having not even told the story of the uh, the raid and the arrest and you know, the, the way that you were treated. It, it was it was really something else. And I do want to say I really appreciate seeing your your Instagram battles with the judge and and standing up publicly in that. And I understand, you know, that there are a lot of people who face uh, not just the the direct persecution, but all of those other things you mentioned of hardships associated with going through these legal challenges. So um, I, I want to you know, jump ahead to uh, your, your involvement with Richard Nixon and, and see if there's a connection here because you have, uh, you have the famous Nixon tattoo in the middle of your back. Uh, one of the questions that we got from our fans today was uh, if you were going to get a Trump tattoo next to the Nixon tattoo, and I, I think a, a better question would be that you've worked with both. How do they compare? Well, uh, first of all, I'll take the tattoo question first. What I was thinking of doing is adding Goldwater, Reagan, and Trump for kind of a Mount Rushmore effect on my back. 
Now, I'd have to get really drunk to do that because it would be very painful, but I am actively considering it. Uh, secondarily, um, if I had to compare Trump with another president that I uh, had an intimate association with, it would be Reagan. Uh, he's more like Reagan in the sense that he's a big picture guy. Uh, he's more like Reagan in his public persona. Uh, you know, they're both tall, broad-shouldered, commanding media presence. Nixon, on the other hand, was an extra was an introvert in an extrovert's business. He was um, uh, he was intimately involved with detail of all of his policies. Some of his policies very great, some of them deeply flawed. I mean. He reached a strategic arms limitation agreement with the Soviets. He opened the door to China, although I think he would be spinning in his grave if he saw the way we had then handed them so many advantages. Uh, he ended the war in Vietnam. He ended military conscription through the draft. He gave us the 18-year-old vote. Uh, he desegregated the public schools without incident, without bloodshed. Uh, uh, he gave us, uh, uh, you know, the, the war on cancer, but he also made egregious mistakes, the war on drugs being his biggest one. And I've said this for 30 years, so there's no hypocrisy here. It's his biggest single mistake, but let's be very clear. He's not the one who turbocharged the war on drugs. He's not the one who provided for the harsh mandatory uh, penalties for the first time nonviolent crime of possession of small amounts of drugs for personal use. That would be Joe Biden and Bill Clinton. Let's be very clear. So they took a bad policy and they made it much, much worse. And they should answer for that because Joe Biden has incarcerated more poor people and more black people in this country for nonviolent crimes than anybody in American history, save Bill Clinton and Bill Clinton's not on the ballot this year. And should he take Kamala Harris as his running mate, she, her, her track record as a district attorney and attorney general uh, of California on this very issue is abysmal. She has incarcerated more poor black people than any state figure you can name. And in many cases, she extended their incarceration past their sentence so the state could take advantage of their cheap labor. What kind of, what kind of, a, a, of a person is this? So this is, I think, an important issue. Trump, to his credit, has championed the Second Chance Act to get some of those people trapped in the bowels of our penal system for ridiculously long sentences uh, out of prison to try to rebuild their lives. So the war on drugs and these tough mandatory penalties where a judge has no discretion. I'm not talking about drug kingpins and drug dealers. I'm talking about the single mother with three kids who's caught with a small amount of marijuana in her purse should not go to prison for 25 years. The war on drugs is destroying lives, destroying families, rehabilitating no one. If you're a conservative, you're paying billions of dollars to house and feed people who are not violent criminals. Drug abuse is a public health issue. It is not a criminal justice issue. Uh, and uh, I would like to see the president take marijuana off the schedule one list. I would like to see him reform the current archaic drug laws that, that give a judge uh, some discretion uh, in terms of sentencing, the woman I just described should go to probation and public health services, not prison. So, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. This is why I'm not going to just drop out of this business and open a shelter for, for, you know, stray dogs, which is what I would do otherwise, what I would like to do otherwise. I continue to stay in the arena and fight for the things I believe in. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, law reform is a major area of my interest. Uh, and, I, and criminal justice reform, now that I've experienced it, uh, uh, will be a new focus, or I should say an increased focus. Well, Roger, I, I want to get to all the audience questions here. Um, and, and if you don't mind, uh, we'll take some comments from the, the live stream. And if you want to ask Roger nasty questions, we can, re he's, he's, Thickest skin guy in the game, I, I know. Care. You want to ask? I just care. Care. We're we're gonna have some fun with this, but Roger, there, there was one general, you know, and, and some of these I'm gonna read verbatim, and 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 some of them I'm summarizing. But there's there's one genuine critique or, or, or trend of critiques of, of your recent interviews and some of your demeanor that that I I, I do really have to challenge you on. Some of the, the flirting with racism language, I think 
uh, something that you said in a recent interview. You know, no, I, I know you had no, to all your no, 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 no. something I'm alleged to have said. I can, I can, I can prove to you forensic evidence that I was duped in an audio that that I that they dropped in a bite in the middle. In the middle, I sent this. I out sent this to three different sound engineers. All had the exact same analysis, but I finally found one willing to back it up with their name because oh, I don't need Black Lives Matter to show up at my office and destroy my business. Anybody who knows me knows that I was opposed to stop and frisk in New York City, that I uh, wrote uh, editorials against my own boss, Ronald Reagan, when he refused to extend the Voting Rights Act, that I'm the last conservative on earth that continues to support affirmative action, uh, that I have opposed the racist war on drugs for 30 years, uh, that I have crusaded for a pardon for Marcus Garvey, the early civil rights leader, who I believe was railroaded, by the FBI because he was getting a very substantial following in the African-American community in this country. And he, I, I know that they set him up on fake tax evasion charges. Marcus Garvey was Dr. Martin Luther King before Dr. King was Dr. King. Uh, speaking of Dr. King, I was one of the original Republicans who supported a holiday in his name, along with Jack Kemp and, and Governor Tom Kane, both pro-civil rights Republicans. So the idea that I used what some consider a racial epitaph in a, in a recent radio show will be disproven uh, now that I have somebody with the guts to put forward an actual analysis of the entire tape. Uh, this was a setup, and I guess this guy got his 15 minutes of fame out of it. And I know there's a lot of anger on the left about my commutation, so uh, his timing was great, but no, it's not a word I use, uh, and my record speaks for itself. All right, duly noted. Let's see if we can get a lightning round in here. If you're watching on YouTube right now, get us your questions. We've got comment Jim Freedom watching the comments live. So the first one that I think that is, is really important to this bigger conversation that I, 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 mean, I, I want I want there to be a connection where, where there's traditionally been a divide. A lot of libertarians look at you as a representative of Trump supporters and say, screw them all because they're Trump supporters. And I think one of the things that's so cool about you and I being able to sit down like this is showing that, you know, and, and I think the same thing is true with a lot of people on the left, like may, may, maybe more green party types, that there's a genuine desire for justice that we can share and things that we can work together on. So what's the biggest threat to freedom right now, Roger? Well, see, I do think that left and right and even Republican and Democrat is really a Hegelian device that's used to divide people who actually agree on many things. It, it's just a fact that three out of 10 Bernie Sanders voters voted for Donald Trump in the last election because they preferred his stance on war. They don't think we should be marching off to another endless foreign war where we have no inherent interest, spilling blood and treasure. Uh, they agreed with his uh, with his trade policies, where we have been entering a, into these big, one size fits all international trade deals, which just screw American workers and have done nothing for our country, while they're great for our trading partners. So, um, you know, I recognize in libertarianism, there's left libertarians and right libertarians. There are there are libertarians who share more conservative views, for example, on defense. There are libertarians who have more liberal views uh, in some areas, but these devices are used to divide us and to distract us from the fact that the people oppressing us don't really have an ideology other than the ideology of money and power and control, uh, which is why it is... Uh, it is hold on, uh, hold on, you left out pedophilia. Well, How big that, is that? In the, I mean, obviously, if you're a pedophile and power gives you the ability to evade accountability, is, is that a big factor? I mean, a lot of people who are supporting Trump are like, oh, he's going after the pedophiles. I, I mean, I, I, it, Epstein, no, it, Maxwell. It, it's a reality. I mean, it is a political reality. But if you'll go back and look, um, my book, The Clinton's War on Women, is the, I'm the first American writer to expose Jeffrey Epstein. Everything you've learned in the last 18 months about Jeffrey Epstein, every bit of it is all in my book and it's documented. I have the flight logs. I, I report Bill Clinton's 28 uh, trips on, on uh, Epstein's plane. I report the 17 trips by Bill Clinton to the island. Uh, this bombshell revelation last week that 
uh, Virginia Roberts, now Virginia uh, Jaffre, saw Bill Clinton on the island at a party with two 17-year-olds. I had that document in 2016. It's in my book. If you go to my book, The Bush Crime Family, um, I expose the Bush administration's uh, uh, involvement in pedophilia, including accusations against the president himself. So I haven't shied away from reporting on this topic. It is among those in the upper reaches of power, among the power elite, both here in Europe. It, it, is a, it is a mass scandal and it is continuing. Uh, and I do think Trump is the first president who's done anything about it. Uh, but the people who are involved are extraordinarily wealthy, extraordinarily powerful, uh, and uh, they will fight not to be prosecuted, not to be exposed. All right. So direct quote from one of our commenters, which South American leader would Roger Stone most personally like to depose and replace with an American puppet? Well, I'm, uh, I take a dim view uh, on the efforts to unseat Maduro, not that I'm against Maduro, because I am, he's a communist, but what would we do? Replace him with another autocrat so a different group of people can steal the country blind? I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a believer in regime change. I think you may have me confused with someone else. Uh, so I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I really don't like Maduro, just like I really don't like Castro. Uh, because the oppression of communism um, is horrific. But I also don't have any pretense that the election of somebody new would really change anything in terms of the, uh, of the plight of the people and their access to free markets or to uh, upward mobility or to some kind of economic opportunity. All we do would be replace one set of crooks with another set of crooks to rip off the people. So okay, um, I guess I reject the premise of your question. It was a fun, thought-provoking one. The next one, maybe a little more on the nose with Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell and Trump's recent comments, you know, the, the ones of wishing her well. I've met her lots of times. There's a connection there. What is the Trump-Epstein connection? Um, I cover this pretty extensively in my 2016 book. They clearly know each other. Uh, Trump blocks Epstein. He bans him from uh, being a member at Mar-a-Lago fairly early after Epstein hits on one of the uh, women who works in the spa and on the daughter, the underage daughter of one of his friends. So I think he figures it out kind of early. They definitely move in the same circles. On the other hand, Donald Trump has never been on Epstein's plane. Donald Trump has never uh, partied with Epstein in a non-public setting. Donald Trump has never visited his island. But last week, there's multiple stories on uh, Twitter that Roger Stone was seen on Epstein's island. False. Let's see proof of that. I've never even met Epstein, although I have seen him. I saw him from across the room with several hundred people in New York City at a public function. Uh, and you can almost smell the sulfur from there. Uh, but uh, look, I, I cover this very extensively. Sorry, folks, but Jeffrey Epstein's connections to the Clintons, his role as an early funder of the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, his, uh, his, his connections to Democratic Party politics in New York State, he is far closer to the Clintons, uh, who I think have some real exposure than he is to Trump, who know him, but I think has no exposure. Okay, so the next question, Epstein's death in jail. Do you think he killed himself? And regardless, why do you think Trump let that happen? Well, I, first of all, I don't think Trump let it happen, but somebody did. Uh, and the question becomes why and how. How incredibly- Trump stop uh, if, Trump, if, Trump, if Trump wanted Epstein to be able to come and testify, he could have kept him alive. I, I, you're the president. You have a high profile prisoner. I wish I agreed with that. Happen. But unfortunately, you can see that we have rogue elements in our Justice Department. I think that by not cleaning house at the Justice Department and leaving many, many of the Obama Clinton people in place, he doesn't have control of uh, all elements of his own Justice all right, Department. Next. Uh, and therefore, I, I don't. I don't. I also don't think he could anticipate that he would be killed. Perhaps he should have, but I don't think he could. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a certain amount of responsibility there. I think if you really wanted to keep Epstein alive, that the president has that power. But all right, changing subjects to go back to our audience questions. One of our members wanted you to comment on the Brooks Brothers riot, the mob that stopped the recount in Florida. You had an interesting role 
in that yes. critical episode in American politics. Your thoughts now? Yes, 20 again, years after. Again, a flaw in the basic premise of your question. When Democratic Party officials attempted to recount the same pile of ballots the third time, it, in essence, looking to create new votes for Al Gore, in accordance with Florida's sunshine laws, uh, when these officials tried to take the ballots into a closed room with no windows, no doors, and no observers, yes, a group of people physically stood in the way and stopped that, and I told them to do so. That is not right. stopping the recount. It is stopping the third recount of the same ballots. Uh, and I think it was illegal to remove them from the room. Now, this is sometimes confused with another incident that involved one of the county commissioners who was accused of trying to leave the room with ballots. I don't know anything about that. I speak only to the specific situation in which I was involved. I, by the way, um, as I think most people clearly know, never considered myself a Bush Republican. Uh, and the only reason I was embroiled in the recount was because Jim Baker, who as Reagan's chief of staff had helped one of my candidates, Tom Kane of New Jersey, become governor. Uh, I had a political debt to pay. And in my business, if you don't pay your debts, um, you won't be in business very long. Um, all right, so, all right, and, all right. I, I, I knew what you were gonna say about the Brooks Brothers riot. And uh, yeah, there were there were a lot of shenanigans back then. I'm, and I, I'm we happy were, to hear you. We were well right right that's the key thing. Okay. but. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left. I have one big personal question I want to ask you. But first, Jim, do we have any any good any good? I know we've got some trolls in our audience today. Roger Stone, I, I mean, just always going to provoke the trolls. We've got some serious. Questions. But we have, all right. Well, let's see. If we got a lightning round here for Roger uh, from the Daniel audience. Henry, Mr. Stone, Trump made big campaign promises to pull troops out from overseas, but has instead sent six thousand more troops to Afghanistan. Where do you stand on Trump's Middle East hypocrisy? Um, uh, you know, again, I think his instincts um, to get our troops out of Iraq, out of Syria, uh, out of Afghanistan is correct. I think in many cases uh, he has been thwarted or talked out of it by some of his neocon advisors. These are not the people that I would have selected. Let's take H.R. McMaster, for example. Uh, but again, I think his fundamental instincts are good. I think that's proven by the fact that despite several provocations that were that were elevated by people in his own administration to go to war over a drone, um, he correctly decided, no, we're not going to do that. So um, I, I'm going to stick with, uh, with the president because I think his instincts on this are good. Uh, and I hope in a second term we can move to withdraw more of these troops, uh, as I think he wants to do and he recognizes most Americans want to do. Jim? Uh, one more question for Roger. What do you think the outcome of the Durham report will be and will it affect the election? Um, I have some grave concerns about whether there's going to be any outcome at all. First of all, I don't believe that Mr. Durham, it's just an opinion, will make any report prior to the election. And that's problematic. I saw the speed in which they investigated and charged me on essentially fabricated crimes. Um, what has happened here based on newly declassified documents is abundantly clear. There's no dispute about it. We know exactly who did what and when. So the question is, do we have a two-tiered system of justice? Our, Mr. Brennan, who's clearly the ringleader in this illegal coup, uh, who who uh, lied multiple times under oath and, mis and clearly abused his power, and Mr. Comey. Uh, it is interesting that the week that I was convicted, um, the prosecutor in my case, the new prosecutor, J.C. J.P. Cooney, announced that that Andrew McCabe would not be prosecuted for lying to the FBI, which is a more serious crime, penalty-wise, than what I was wrongly convicted of. And prior to that, uh, Attorney General Barr had two recommendations from the Inspector General at the Justice Department for the prosecution of James Comey for lying, uh, both of them more serious crimes than the ones, again, that I was convicted of, lying to Congress, uh, wrongly convicted of, and Mr. Barr gave Mr. Comey a pass. So this leads me to a certain skepticism that anybody will ultimately be prosecuted. Let me say that I hope that I am wrong, but uh, as, as of this moment, I'm still waiting. All right, Roger, I got one last big question for you. I'm really excited about this idea because there have been a lot of people 
challenging Trump about the cognitive test. And I, I you know, Biden uh, avoiding the cognitive test, uh, you know, saying, I don't need it. Are you a junkie? You know, I, it's it's really pretty. It's, it's got to rub you the wrong way. So I'd like to start a super PAC. And I'd like to invite you to join me in this. It would be called Citizens for an Intelligent President. And it exists possibly for one sole purpose, and that's to raise money to challenge all of the candidates who you would say are eligible to be in the debate to take a cognitive test live on national television, streamed from the National Press Club. We raise the money. We say we are going to use this money as a super PAC to broadcast the results. So basically, we we invite uh, if, if the Green Party qualifies the, their candidate, we invite Joe Jorgensen for the Libertarian Party, President Trump and Joe Biden. We say, here's the money. Put up or shut up. Take a cognitive test. Full transparency. We have we have you and you as as the the Republican. Myself as a Libertarian. We recruit a Biden supporter to do this with us, so that it's it's genuinely fair. We get an objective tester to administer uh, a cognitive test, and uh, we we see who, who's really got the chops. What do you say? Well, I'll start at the beginning. Um, I do find it kind of interesting that um, when uh, a black commentator tries to ask Biden about his mental fitness, uh, Biden immediately accuses the guy of being a junkie. Is that not a racist comment? Yeah. To say, what are you on cocaine? Are you some kind of junkie? That certainly seems racist to me. But he didn't seem to get beat up the way that, say, Trump would if he said something like that or even Roger Stone. Well, in, in, in that case, yeah. I mean, I don't want to play devil's advocate too much, but I could excuse Biden as he's he's deliberately. T this is what a racist would say, and it would be inappropriate to ask you if you're a junkie. He's he's saying that what he is saying is inappropriate. But I'm more of, more concerned about both of them really uh, uh, avoiding taking a cognitive test in public. Wouldn't you want to see that? I mean, even well, if we even if we can't get Joe Jorgensen, the Libertarian, or Howie Hawkins, the Green, there to have Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Just hey, you're going to take a cognitive test live in person, side by side. I would hate to see it. It's unnecessary. There's a better way to do it. Let them have a four person debate. People will be able to see in a in a in a in a real time live action situation how all of them conduct themselves. Uh, and I think it'll be abundantly clear after that um, who's uh, uh, who's all there and who is not. Let's have that debate. Suddenly, you have all these Democrats saying, "Well, Biden doesn't need to debate. These debates really don't change anything." Uh, you know, they're easily manipulated. I mean, baloney. It's a tradition in American politics. We should have a debate. I've already said I think it should be open to anybody who can acquire okay, 200. Politically, politically, as a Trump supporter, do you I know you're you're a rational self-interest, real politic kind of guy. You wouldn't be saying this if you didn't think that the libertarian green together would take more votes from Biden than Trump. Right. And, and if that's the case, are you going to be actively promoting getting the libertarian green nominees into a debate actually, with, with Trump. I'm not even sure I'm not even sure that that's actually true. I I actually think just based on looking at past data that it's probably about a wash meaning I think they probably first of all they pull votes from a number of people who wouldn't have voted otherwise who are going there specifically to vote for one of the others. So a significant number of the votes that the minor parties would get wouldn't go to Biden or Trump. And then Based on everything I've seen, they pull from the major parties. It's minor, but they pull from the major parties at about the same level. So I don't, it's not some dirty trick, which I know nothing about, uh, <laughs> not some political machination. It's just a deep seated belief that your participation in the debate should be based on how many states you get on the ballot in. If you fall short of 270, you shouldn't be in the debates because you cannot theoretically be elected. But what I really object to is, you know, you have to score 15 percent in four consecutive polls that we choose. No, that's nonsense. That should not be the measure. Uh, look, I don't think anybody's going to going to listen to me on this. Uh, I'm just giving you my own isolated opinion. But I think all four candidates should be in the debate. Uh, it would be a little more lively if the libertarians had nominated you as opposed to someone whose name at this moment I still can't even remember. Uh, <laughs> but who I don't think is going to end up being a significant factor in the in the race. All right. Well, uh, one last question. Uh, how much do you know about Joe Jorgensen? How much do you love Joe Jorgensen? How much of a wonderful libertarian principled candidate do we have with Joe Jorgensen? Oh, no, I'm sorry, Roger. We don't have time for you to answer those questions. I just want to slip in her name a few more times. 
but hey, it's it's been a wonderful hour. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. And and I, I just want to give you the chance to close out. I want to ask, you know, what's next for Roger Stone? Congratulations again on evading prison time. Uh, you know, for, I, the, the, the line to Congress, you should not get arrested for that. You should get a medal for it. You know, really, like, really that, like, that, if that's the real crime, you know, at, at all, like, that you lied to Congress, no, there is no way that jail time is justified. And I'm very happy to congratulate you on uh, a, a new a new lease on life, wherever you are. So please, you know, what's next? And, and, and what, you know, what else would you like our audience to know today? Well, uh, I have to assume that your slavish endorsement of the Libertarian Party candidate is only because you intend to make another bid for that party's nomination in four years. If that's the case, I congratulate you. You've learned something from me anyway. <laughs> Secondarily, I'm not the only reason. I'm going to write a book about this entire experience because for 16 months I was gagged. Nobody's really heard my entire side of it. Believe me, uh, when they say Stone got special treatment, you, they're not kidding. When 29 FBI agents in SWAT uh, gear, wearing night goggles and carrying assault weapons, storm your house at six o'clock in the morning, arriving in 17 armored vehicles, a helicopter and two amphibious units on the canal behind your house, replete with frogmen who are uh, equally armed uh, to arrest you for uh, a nonviolent white collar process crime. That's most definitely special treatment, particularly when they tip off CNN who arrives 14 minutes before you're arrested. Uh, while at the same time, the FBI is telling my neighbors to stay in their home. It's a dangerous situation. It's obviously not dangerous for CNN. Uh, and the idea that I had to be arrested in this manner because I was a flight risk is disproved by the fact that the government knows I have no passport, uh, no valid passport. They know I don't own a gun, although I strongly support the Second Amendment. Uh, they know that I have, it's publicly known that I'm under investigation because they have leaked it so many times. Therefore, I'm widely recognized. And they disprove it four hours later when I'm arraigned and they don't ask for any cash bond for my release, proving that they never thought I was a uh, flight risk. So I'm going to write a book about this entire experience to finally get a chance to tell my side of it. it the fight unfortunately continues as Robert Mueller himself and Andrew Weissman and Congressman Jerry Nadlier uh, and Schiff and others attempt to recycle the same nonsense again about what I did and did not do and what I knew and what I did not know. And I think that has been pretty clearly established. Uh, and then uh, beyond that, I'll just be out here fighting for liberty and freedom. I'm not going to go away. People want to help me can go to stonedefensefund.com, stonedefensefund.com. Uh, uh, yes, I have to finance an appeal, which is going to take a year and a million dollars. Uh, it's, it is not easy, but I, I am committed to it. I do have some trepidation because if my verdict is, uh, is thrown out, I would have to stand trial before the exact same judge. And I don't think I was treated fairly. And therefore I have to question whether I would be treated even more fairly, uh, unfairly than I was the first time. It's a vexing question, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to exonerate my my name because this is nonsense. Um, I did not lie to Congress regarding anything material or with intent, and therefore I didn't violate the law. And then the threatening a witness thing is complete nonsense. The the witness that I'm accused of having uh, tampered with testified on the stand that he never felt threatened by me. Wrote a letter to the judge that said the same thing. This is the same guy, by the way who threatened to shoot other witnesses in the head who were exculpatory to my case. This but is anyway, critical, right? It's extraordinary. Now, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit familiar with, with the, the, the Credico backstory. And I, I, I mean, I look at that and it's, it's so silly. I have to wonder if you guys deliberately set that up as some kind of drama that, that went awry or went too far. Well, uh, the problem, of course, is that he is my source regarding the what little I knew about the WikiLeaks disclosures, I gave the special counsel's office 30 pages of text messages uh, that were exculpatory and indisputably proved that. They chose to ignore it. They had multiple witnesses in front of the grand jury that, dis that disproved their theory and proved that he was my source. It will all come out on appeal. It will, it will be ultimately proven uh, on appeal. I was not happy with the job my lawyers did in cross-examining him. In retrospect, I recognize I should have just represented myself Certainly would have been more colorful, I guarantee you that. 
Uh, but, you know, I, I will continue to fight to clear my name despite the extraordinary expense. Uh, there is, you know, there's a huge movement among left wing Democrats to to reinvestigate me. Evidently, they think that there's more to find when there is no more to find. There's also some lame arguments that I can be reindicted on the same charges. I don't think that's the case. Uh, but I have to be wary about that because the deep state lives and they don't like free thinkers and they don't like people who stick their thumb in the eye of authority uh, and they don't like people who blaze their own trail. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a conservative who's against the war on drugs. I don't care if you don't like it. It's just the way it is. I, I'm a conservative who doesn't believe in endless foreign war where we have no interests. So I'm going to continue to stick to what I do. Um, and uh, I won't be opening a shelter for um, for stray dogs, unfortunately, anytime soon. But that would be the next thing I would do if I could. Well, I hope you'll uh, continue to stand there for uh, or to stand for Julian Assange and his work and, and help him get the same uh, positive outcome. No, uh, I, I really think what is being done to him is horrific. Uh, he is not a Russian asset. Sorry, John Brennan. You have no proof of that. That's nonsense. Uh, and none of his releases killed thousands of American troops. That's not true either. All he's done is embarrass the power elite. He is, he is, and they didn't, they didn't charge him with anything related to the uh, obtaining or publishing of Hillary's or the DNC's emails. They have alleged that he is hacking when all he's doing is talking to a hacker. Well, by that standard, the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal should be prosecuted. They publish uh, uh, classified information that they get from illicit sources all the time. Uh, what is being done to Assange is criminal. It is horrific. It makes me sick to my stomach. Uh, and I'm for freedom for Julian Assange. My position hasn't changed. And no Democrats. He's not a Russian asset. So cut the crap. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you so much, Roger. Again, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, you know, any, anything people need to know about how to connect with you, other things to support you? Uh, you have stonezone.com. Is, well, is that your main website? No, actually, I'm going to go back to the stonecoldtruth.com. Remember, I was barred from having anything whatsoever on social media uh, or on the Internet. So if I, you know, had a great hamburger at lunch and I took a picture of it and put it on Instagram, I would have been instantly jailed by saying, wow, this was a great burger. So uh, I'm going to ramp Stone Cold Truth back up. I've already begun writing there. Uh, also, you know, aggregating stories that I think aren't getting any attention in the mainstream media so that they will get attention. Adam, you're invited to write there anytime you would like on any subject you would like. We will not edit or censor anything you want to say. Well, if you were in favor of child pornography, we probably wouldn't let you post that. But otherwise, no you'd problem. be welcome. All right. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Roger. Really appreciate it. Uh, I, I encourage everybody to at least, you know, be keeping an eye on, on Roger Stone. He, I am, I am excited uh, that he is going to continue to be a major player in American politics. And I hope in the off chance that Joe Jorgensen doesn't win in 2020 and we have President Trump for a second term, that Roger will have his ear pulling him in a libertarian direction on all of these issues. Thanks for having me, Adam. It's great to be with you and God bless you.